Okay, here we go. Stand by. Three, two, one, action. Assume nothing. Brash, bald face, blasphemy. Question everything. I find it extremely hard to imagine. Open your eyes. It is quite all right to be an atheist. The fastest growing group of people in the country has been measured as being those who have no belief or who are atheists. You don't have to be apologetic or quiet about it. Challenge the opposition. You see religion on a hundred fronts losing the argument. And start thinking. This is The Thinking Atheist Worldwide. Today's sponsor is audible.com a leading provider of spoken audio information and entertainment you can listen to audiobooks wherever and whenever you want audible.com thanks so much for being a part of the show tonight it's kind of a light-hearted show we do a lot of stuff about superstition in relation to religion right we're talking about doctrine and dogma what this religion believes what that religion believes and tonight's going to do a little bit of that but we're going to talk about a lot of fun stuff and the stuff that you and I might be doing on our own every day. You know, some of those little superstitions that you pick up that they don't make sense on paper, <laughs> but they make you feel good, right? They make you feel good because if you don't do it, well, calamity just might befall all of us. There was a, a report done by CBS Sunday Morning. Susan Spencer of uh, CBS's 48 Hours did a story called Superstitions, Why You Believe. And in the article, she said this. She said, count yourself lucky if you're not superstitious. Connecticut College psychologist Stuart Weiss says this. Most people are superstitious. In a world where we prize science... This may not be something to be proud of. Well, what is superstition? It is a belief or an action that is inconsistent with science, and it needs to be aimed at bringing about good luck or avoiding bad luck. According to Stuart Weiss, only 40% of Americans believe in evolution, and over half of Americans have some kind of superstition that they believe in. So more Americans believe in some kind of a superstition than they believe in evolution by natural selection. <laughs> That's a little scary. There's a CBS poll for Sunday morning that said that more than half of all Americans, 51% of them, knock on wood to avoid bad luck. 16% won't open an umbrella inside. 13%, more than 1 in 10, carry some kind of a good luck charm with them. And one in ten avoids black cats. For real. In the year 2013, people are avoiding the black cat. I was looking up some specific superstitions. And there are so many to choose from. I mean, I just had to kind of cherry pick. But a few interesting ones that you may not have heard of before. For example, in some parts of Turkey... You want to think twice before you chew gum at night. Because according to superstition, after dark, the chewing gum turns into rotting dead flesh. It's like cannibalism, like you're chewing on a person. <laughs> what? I can't chew gum after dark. You've heard of Swiss cheese, cheddar cheese, pepper jack cheese. Mozzarella cheese. Have you ever heard of groaning cheese? In medieval England, mothers who were expecting babies made what they called a groaning cheese. It was this large cheese wheel. They let it mature for nine months as the unborn baby grew. And when the, quote, groaning time or the time of birth came, because she would groan during childbirth, the whole family would celebrate by eating the cheese until nothing but the outer rind was left. The newborn would then be passed through the rind on christening day, which would bless the child with a long and prosperous life. Some people believe in horseshoes. Horseshoes are supposed to be good luck. They're also supposed to keep away bad dreams. Here's how it works. You hang a horseshoe in the bedroom or on a doorknob with the ends pointing upward. 
This belief stems, according to lore, from the fact that a horseshoe has seven holes, and seven supposed to be a lucky number, and it's made of iron, so it can ward off evil spirits that might haunt you in your dreams. I guess iron is some kind of a special metal. What? Chariots of iron in the Bible, right? Friday the 13th has been a huge source of superstition ever since the 19th century. And the impact is everywhere. I mean, a lot of people will specifically avoid doing anything significant. They'll skip a business meeting. They won't attend a social event or party. Some people won't even go into work. Some people won't drive a car. Some people don't leave the house because it's Friday the 13th. Apparently, this is rooted in ancient and separate bad luck associations with the number 13 and the day Friday. There's this Norse myth about 12 gods, and they had a dinner party at Valhalla, which is their heaven, by the way. And into the party walked the uninvited guest, guest number 13, the mischievous Loki. Now, once there, Loki arranged for Hodor, the blind god of darkness, to shoot Baldur the Beautiful, the god of joy and gladness, with a mistletoe-tipped arrow. And Baldur died, and then the earth got dark and the entire planet grieved. There's a biblical reference to the unlucky number 13, right? Judas, the apostle who betrayed Christ, he was the 13th guest to the Last Supper. A hugely horrific event happened on a Friday the 13th in the Middle Ages. 1306, King Philip of France arrested the revered Knights Templar and began torturing them, marking the occasion as a day of evil. In ancient Rome, witches reportedly gathered in groups of twelve. The thirteenth was believed to be the devil. Both Friday and the number thirteen were once associated with capital punishment. In British tradition, Friday was the conventional day that they hung people in public. And there were supposedly, according to legend, thirteen steps that led up to the platform where they would be hung. It is traditionally believed that Eve tempted Adam with the apple in the Garden of Eden. Actually, it wasn't an apple. It was a fruit. I don't know. That's a distinction we always have to make. It wasn't an apple. It was a fruit. That happened supposedly according to tradition on a Friday. Tradition also has it, the flood in the Bible, Noah's flood, the great flood, the confusion that happened at the Tower of Babel, and the death of Christ all took place on a Friday. Numerologists apparently consider the number 12 a quote-unquote complete number. 12 months in a year, 12 signs of the Zodiac, 12 gods of Olympus, the 12 labors of Hercules, the 12 tribes of Israel, the 12 apostles of Christ. And if you exceed that by one, well, the number 13 is associated as bad luck. It's just a little bit beyond complete. It's too much. It is... It is not a complete thing. Did you know that more than 80% of high-rise buildings lack a 13th floor? Well, they've got a 13th floor. But they don't call it that. Look at the numbers on the elevator. 11, 12, 14, 15. If you stand on the street and look up and count them, there's a 13th floor. (laughs) But they don't call it that. Many airports will skip the number 13 for gate numbers. After all, imagine people sitting there, waiting to board the plane, and they're at gate 13. Apparently, airplanes don't have a 13th aisle. Is that true? God, you know, I fly all the time, and I haven't even looked. There are no 13... I mean, numbered 13. We know there's a 13th aisle. I'm flying to Boston for the convention here in uh, 10 days. I've got to remember to go and count (laughs) to see if it's listed right there above the the, uh, overhead baggage compartment. Is there a 13? Many hospitals and hotels don't have a room 13. In Italy, they omit the number 13 from the national lottery. On streets in Florence, Italy, the house between number 12 and 14 is not 13. They call it 12 and a half. Many cities don't have a 13th Street or even a 13th Avenue. Now, I guess there's a name for people who fear 13. And I can't say it. It's a multi-syllable word. And right now, there are people in our audience who know it who are mocking me. 
<laughs> You're saying it out loud. Triscade? Tris, Triscadophobes? Wait, Trisk? Triscadicophobes. T R I S K A I D E K A P H O B E S. Good luck with that. By the way, I can already see the mountain of emails coming in from people telling me, here's phonetically how you say it. I'm going to go look it up. Just relax. And if I'd looked it up, I'd still forget. Tris Triscadicophobes. Triscadicophobes? The ill fated mission to the moon. Apollo 13, right? The one where everything went awry and we almost lost the astronauts in space? They say if you have 13 letters in your name, you'll have the devil's luck. Here are some examples. Jack the Ripper. Charles Manson. Jeffrey Dahmer. Theodore Bundy. Albert DeSalvo. They all have 13 letters in their names. Coincidence? I don't know. And we haven't even covered all the stuff with 13 and Friday the 13th. It's fascinating stuff. Have you heard about this one? It's the curse of the opal stone. Now, if your favorite stone is the opal, you're literally out of luck. Because the stone is supposed to bring bad luck to whoever wears it if it is not your birthstone, as I understand it. If it's your birthstone, you get a pass. Apparently, according to a best-selling novel by Sir Walter Scott in 1829. The protagonist was falsely accused of being a demon, and she dies shortly after a drop of holy water accidentally falls on her opal jewelry and then changes its color. And apparently the book was so popular and had such an effect on pop culture at the time, the opal market crashed and the price of opal dropped by half. 50%. What about the black cat? This one may be more appropriate for the Halloween season, but we'll talk about it now. They say if a black cat crosses your path, you got bad luck. Apparently, this particular superstition originates again in the Middle Ages, and it was due to the false belief that single women, usually elderly, who associated themselves with many cats, were actually witches who could become cats themselves. Thus, if a black cat crossed your path, it might be a witch. In show business, when somebody goes on stage, sometimes they'll say, break a leg. Apparently, it's bad luck to wish someone good luck in show business. In theater, if you wish someone good luck, it's bad. Don't do that. So what they do is they do the opposite. Break a leg. Hope something horrible happens to you. <laughs> I guess the reverse psychology. <laughs> <laughs> May a chandelier descend upon you as you perform. Wishing them good luck would have literally called down. Certainly a, a misfortune of some kind would have befallen. Would have been horrible. So you don't do that. You say, hey, break a leg. A lot of superstitions out there about the crow. Now, it's believed that the amount of crows has the ability to predict your fortune. One crow is bad. Two crows, well, that's luck. Three is health. Four is wealth. Five crows is sickness. Six is death. More than six? Hey, you got me. Did you know there's a superstition that says that if you look into a mirror, the mirror steals your soul? Remember the classic animated Disney cartoon, Snow White? It was the evil queen using a mirror to harm Snow White. Narcissus ensnared by his own reflection. Soulless vampires, they have no reflection in a mirror. Think twice before you look in the mirror. It could steal your soul. By the way, breaking the mirror is bad luck as well. Seven years. Some superstitious sources say this. They say the trapped souls adversely influence your luck. So you break the mirror. Do they roam free? Do they splinter out? Do they gain power? Do they re-enter our world? I don't know, but you don't want to break a mirror that's seven years. Photographs are supposed to also capture your soul. When photography was first invented back in the early 19th century, people all over the world held the ridiculous belief that taking someone's picture was akin to taking their soul. Therefore, if an enemy was able to get a picture of you, he or she not only held your soul but had spiritual power over you. 
had an email in from Carrie. Carrie said, when I saw the title for today's show, I knew I had to write in. I come from a family of interesting contradictions. My parents were devoutly religious, but also had a strong respect for science, going so far as to send me to a science academy rather than a Christian one. It was always astounding to me that my mother, though an incredibly smart woman, was so superstitious. One popular superstition she always held to was tossing salt over your left shoulder after spilling some to ward off the devil. We were also strictly forbidden to open umbrellas indoors, though now that I think of it, with how small our house was, that might have been purely for physical safety. Another common warning was not to pick up a coin from the ground that was lying tails up. Being the greedy little bastard I am, I almost always disregarded this. But it's not just Christian families that I've found to be superstitious. Even my atheist girlfriend and her agnostic mother have a few traditions that are based in the nebula of faith rather than grounded on solid fact. Her mother always leaves the chairs of her table turned out to invite weary spirits to rest. Several gargoyle figurines rest around their house to protect against evil spirits and ill intent, which puzzles me because my girlfriend is usually such a skeptic of anything spiritual. Even at work, superstitions come up frequently. I worked as a cashier, and whenever someone's total would come to six dollars and sixty-six cents, six, 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 or some similar variant, they would glance around in paranoia and quickly grab a bag of chips or another small item to make their total something different. It was baffling, though good for business. Carrie, thank you very much for the message. I have a photograph of a fast food receipt I had a couple of years ago. It was $6.66. And it's funny, the effect that that number has on people. Even the cashier looked at it funny. And there are people who are rushing, get a candy bar, get a pack of gum, do something. It can't be 666. As if what? It's going to open the portals of hell and Satan himself will then have a conduit into this world. He's going to use your change at the gas and sip to come and wreak havoc on humankind. Area code 323. You're on the Thinking Atheist Radio podcast. Who's this? Hi, uh, my name is Aaron. Thanks for calling the show. What do you have for us? Sorry, I might be a little laggy. I'm uh, using Google Voice. It's my first time, so I'm not sure how well it's working. I can hear you. Go Um, ahead. I was born into a Jewish family, and Jews actually have some superstitions of their own. I'm not sure if Christians have the same ones or one. But there are some pretty weird ones. There are, uh, like a pregnant woman, if she steps on like nails that you clip, they think that she'll lose the baby. I've actually had people, like when I was clipping my nails, people have told me, you know, be very careful because they follow that religiously. Also, okay, hang on. Uh, because I'm having a little bit of a difficult time hearing you. You're talking about like fingernails and toenails that are clipped? Yeah. And yeah, if nails those are lying on the off. ground and a pregnant okay. woman steps upon them, then the baby's in danger? Yeah, she'll lose the baby. Wow, that's crazy. And do they hold to this? Are they genuinely weird about uh, fingernails and toenails? Yeah, it's pretty weird. Like when I'm clipping my nails, like I've been clipping my nails somewhere and people have, you know, come up to me and been like, be very careful with that. And I'm like, okay, calm down. Wow. Uh, also, I think this might also be a Christian one. I'm not sure. Uh, stepping over a person, let's say laying on the ground or something, that they're not going to grow. That they're not going to grow? A, yeah. Like let's say a kid's laying on the floor and you step over them or whatever. So if, all right, again, I'm having a little bit of a difficult time hearing. If let's say we got a, uh, there's a kid, nine-year-old kid laying on the ground watching TV and I need to get to the kitchen and I step over him or her, I have then stunted that child's growth. Yeah. Unless you step back over. (laughs) Oh, just to step backwards to undo it. (laughs) Yeah. It's pretty ridiculous. Yeah. When I was a kid, I used to always say, step over my sister, she would start screaming, thinking, you know, she's in peril of never growing again. Wow. Even when I was religious, I thought thought that was pretty ridiculous even back then. That's crazy. That's really good stuff. Well, I appreciate the call very much, and thanks for listening to the show. Take care of yourself. You too. Thank you for hosting the fun thing. All right. Take it easy. Google Voice. I haven't used it. Do you guys have any luck with it? Our sponsor for this show, by the way, Audible.com. I've had a lot of people tell me that they have enjoyed the audio version 
of my book called Deconverted, A Journey from Religion to Reason, because it's formatted a lot like a radio show. And people will often say, look, how can we support the show? How can we support what this site does? How can we support what you do? And I'm like, well, just listening to the show means a lot to me and watching the videos and spreading the word and being a part of the online community is huge for me. If people want to go a step further, I always encourage them, if you'd like, pick up a copy of the book. And a great option for that is the audio book. It runs about four and a half, five hours long. And it's formatted a lot like this show is. It's very conversational. It's on audible.com. And I love Audible because they have a lot of the books that I like to listen to. I've been listening to Dr. Richard Carrier's book, Why I'm Not a Christian, on Audible. I was listening to David Fitzgerald's book, Nailed, on Audible. And since I do a lot of travel, it's a lot easier sometimes if I'm on the road. I can't, I'm driving, I can't read. <laughs> I can't pick up my Kindle and read. I just pop it in and I'm able to listen to it. And many times I'll listen to them over and over and over because I enjoy conversation while I'm traveling, while I'm doing my thing. Hell, I'm just hanging around the house, just chilling out. Audible.com has a page set up. If you want to go check them out, you can get a free audio book and a 30-day trial today by signing up at audiblepodcast.com slash thinkingatheist. Check it out. Give it a shot. Audiblepodcast.com slash Thinking Atheist. Area code 859. You're on the Thinking Atheist radio podcast. Who's this? Tristan. Tristan, thanks for calling the show. What's going on? Not too much. I uh, understand that this is about more about superstitions and less about religion. I've got a, uh, I guess, a, hopefully a pretty good one, entertaining one for you. Go for it. Uh, would you consider yourself a football fan? Well, I mean, I'll watch the occasional game, but whatever. Why? What do you have for us? I'm an Alabama fan. So I'm used to the absolute most ravenous, crazy fans that are out there. Yeah, the um, Crimson Tide. You guys are hardcore down there. Hard we are. Uh, I will say that I am not as hardcore as my counterparts. Uh, they're some of my close, some great people. But uh, I will say that as far as making sure that the flag is outside of the car on game day or that you're wearing a specific shirt, uh, I don't necessarily go to those specific lengths. Well, they just won, um, didn't they uh, win the national championship just recently? So, I mean, they're on top of the world, on top of all that. So, that's huge. Oh, yes, yes. For the second year running and for three times in the past four years. Not that I know that for anything. Oh, all right. So, there's a, what is a superstition <laughs> associated with Alabama or, or what? Uh, not necessarily with, with Alabama. It's more so it surrounds a football fans. Well, what are you talking about? I mean, what are people the, doing? Uh, well, some of the things that I'm seeing are, for instance, on game day. They'll have to have the flag flying outside of the passenger side of the car. They'll have to wear the specific shirt. So every year they have a coach's polo, and they get that, and they have to wear that on game day. And they wear the same shirt for every single game day the entire season. Yeah, you don't want to change yeah. a winning streak there. you got to wear the same shirt. Exactly. Wear the lucky shirt. Exactly. And honestly, these guys, they're very scientific they're actually kind of the ones that um, kind of got me interested in more scientific things, even though they are believers themselves. They actually helped me on my journey to apostasy by sparking my interest in some scientific things. But uh, normally very reasonable, very rational people. But then whenever it comes to game day, that all just seems to go out the window. It, there's like a, was it an ESPN commercial? It's a sports commercial that shows everybody doing these odd traditions you know they're they have these weird little picadillos that they do and the end of the commercial says something like it's not ridiculous if it works or something like that it brings it that works. commercial to mind so yeah i can't think of uh it's i'm sure i've seen something a bit more ridiculous than just the flag out of the car or the same shirt every game day but I, i'm drawing a blank right now but well, i've got a few of those i've got a few sports can... traditions lined up here so we'll cover some of those thanks for listening and thanks for being a part of the show all right take care all right. Sports fans are hugely superstitious. A few sports superstitions. Playing baseball, you got to spit into your hand before you pick up the baseball bat. That's good luck. A wad of gum on a player's hat. Good luck. If a dog walks across the diamond before the first pitch is thrown. Very bad. Some players think it's good luck to step on one of the bases before running off the field at the end of every inning. Gotta hit a base, touch it. You're good. Some players sleep with their bat to break out of a hitting slump 
or to stay on a groove. You're hitting well. Don't screw that up. Give it a name and take it to the sack. <laughs> I don't know about giving it a name. I just added that in there. Alice, it's time for bed. If a pitcher is throwing a perfect game or a no-hitter, don't say anything about it. Don't speak of it while it's going on. You'll jinx it. Basketball. Wipe the soles of your sneakers. That's good luck. And you bounce the ball before you take a foul shot. That's good luck. Bowling. To continue a winning streak, always wear the same clothes. If you put the number 300, which was a perfect score in bowling, put that on your license plate. Carry charms in your bowling bag. Football. Double numbers on a player's uniform is good luck. It's bad luck for a pro football player to take a new number when he's traded to another team. Try to keep the same one. The mascot, not just for entertainment, it's an important good luck icon. And they, they have superstitions for fishing. Spit on your bait before you cast your rod. This will make the fish bite. If you catch the first fish, toss it back for good luck the rest of the day. It's bad luck to change your rod. By the way, fish are not allowed to bite if a barefoot woman passes you on the way to the dock. Who came up with that one? Couple more. In golf, start your game with only odd-numbered clubs. Don't hit the six iron. No, make it a five or a seven. Golf ball with a number on it higher than four, bad luck. And always carry coins in your pockets, by the way. Even if you don't need them, just hang on to them. Tennis. Bad luck to hold more than two balls at a time when serving. It's bad luck to wear yellow. Always walk around the outside of the court when switching sides. That's good luck. And whatever you do, don't step on the lines. They even have rodeo superstitions. Ever been to a rodeo? Always put the right foot in the stirrup first. Always shave, if you're a man, before a competition. And whatever you do, don't wear yellow. A ton of these things out there. And a lot of otherwise rational people hold to them. Brad sent me a message. He said, I got a good one for you. I've been living in Japan for about 14 years now. Even though Japan's largely secular, they do have some strange superstitions. Some believe that your blood type determines your personality. When someone asks you what your blood type is, it might be they're wondering what type of person you are. I usually bite my tongue. Most people here don't care what religion you are, and to ask is almost taboo. It's kind of like, hey, what color is your underwear? Which makes me facepalm sometimes when I'm asked this question. Brad in Japan, thanks so much. Bruce said, hey, I wanted to drop a line and share some superstitions common down here in southern Louisiana. You're down there where uh, Jerry DeWitt is. That's awesome. He says, we used to say when it rains and the sun is out, the devil is either beating his wife or marrying off his daughter. What? When it rains and the sun is out, the devil is either beating his wife or marrying off his daughter. Or if a snapping turtle bites you, he won't let go until he hears thunder. If someone dies and the wake is in their house, all the mirrors will be covered with a towel or cloth. If you made a funny face in the mirror and lightning struck, it would stay that way. If a girl whistled, the Virgin Mary would cry. If a pregnant woman is upset about seeing a person with some type of physical or mental handicap, her child will be born with the same handicap. If while sleeping, while sweeping, I read that one totally wrong, <laughs> sorry Bruce, while sweeping, as in with a broom, and if you sweep over your foot, spit on the broom, or you get bad luck. If you dig a hole on Good Friday, you'll find blood in it. And these are easy enough to disprove, right? You go out and dig a hole on a Good Friday. That's got to be Jesus, right? 
right? Christ was crucified on that Friday. If you drop a dish towel, you're sure to have company soon. Bruce, thank you so much for some Southern Louisiana superstitions. Back to the switchboard. Uh, let's see, area code 330. You're on the Thinking Atheist radio podcast. Who's this? Hey, that's Tommy. Thanks so much for calling, Tommy. What's going on? I'm not a superstitious guy, but a couple of years back, my uncle died in his house. He, was, he had been sick for a while. And when we went over to visit, there were about 20 to 30 crows hanging over his house. Like, there, there was a big tree in the backyard, so they would perch there and fly around in circles. And it was really creepy. I know you had mentioned crows earlier in your show, and it was really weird. I mean, even though you're rational, you have to look at that and sort of get goosebumps. Oh, it was strange. I mean, I know I know that crows have been associated with death, but just not in that sense. And it was just, they had never actually been there until that day. So that was the strange part. Awesome. All right, man. Thanks so much for the call. Thanks for listening. We'll see you later. Yeah, see you, man. Area code 314. You're on the Thinking Atheist radio podcast. Who's this? Hey, Seth. This is Mike. Mike, thanks for calling. We're talking superstitions today. Do you have anything for us? Yeah, I got a couple for you. A lot of silly ones I was taught growing up. I actually wanted to start with the Friday the 13th because you went into it. Uh, When I was growing up, my mother kept telling me over and over again that the reason Friday the 13th is an unlucky day is because that's the Good Friday that Jesus was crucified on. Did she hole up in the house? Did she alter her behavior or activity on a Friday the 13th? Did she really have some fears? No, she just told me that's why it was an unlucky day and why everyone was taboo about it. Well, you know, we've all been taught crazy stuff growing up, trust me, you know? I got a couple more uh, related to board games. Um, In Monopoly, I've always heard that it's unlucky to purchase the first property you land on. Really? In Monopoly. Even if it's Boardwalk or Park Place? I highly doubt that would happen, but yeah. You can't pass up, boy. You're absolutely right on the first roll. What am I thinking? Got to go all the way around the board. (laughs) Sorry, allow me to pull my head up. Okay, there. All right, much better. Now I can breathe. All right, so it's unlucky to purchase the first property you land on in Monopoly. Yeah. I was also taught it's unlucky in chess to castle to the queen side. And then the last one I want to share is that it's unlucky in the game of risk to lose your first battle when it's your turn to be the attacker. You're playing to win, but you lose the first battle and you're screwed for the rest of the game. I see. Yeah, I see it. The chat room's still bitching about Boardwalk and Park Place. I I understand. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, I appreciate you listening to the show and sharing some superstitions. Thanks for calling. You're welcome, Seth. I just want to say I love your book. Thank you. Well, thanks for reading it, and it just makes my day. So take it easy, okay? All right, have a good one. All right, thanks. Uh, Let's see here. Itchy palms are good luck. Really? An itchy palm generally refers to someone who is greedy or has an insatiable desire for money. In Shakespeare's Julius Caesar... Brutus says, let me tell you, Cassius, you yourself are much condemned to have an itching palm. Some believe if the right palm itches, you'll meet someone new, while an itchy left palm means money is coming your way. That sounds like good fortune if your palms are itchy. The superstition involving wishing upon the first star you see in the evening Well, there's a lot of different supposed origins for that one. However, Europeans believed that the gods would occasionally look down upon the earth, and when they moved the sky, a star would escape and fall down. The Greeks also believed that the stars were falling human souls, and it was lucky to make a wish upon them. We just mentioned a few minutes ago the broom. A lot of broom superstition. Don't lean a broom against a bed. Evil spirits, don't do it. If you sweep trash out the door after dark, a stranger will come to visit you. If someone sweeps over the floor and sweeps over your feet, you'll never be married. If you move to a different house, don't take the broom. Throw it out, you gotta buy a new one. 
And if you have an unwelcome guest, somebody comes over and they're driving you freaking crazy and they leave and you don't ever want them to come back, go to the room they stayed in and sweep it. <laughs> and apparently this sort of casts a mojo upon the whole situation and they won't come back. Another big one that we all grew up with was walking under a ladder. It's bad luck to walk under a ladder. Well, I never really understood why. It's a ladder. I mean, I can understand walking under it. You don't want to walk under it because something may fall on you, or the ladder may slip, or what if there's a gallon of paint up there, or tools, or whatever. But the superstitious reason for doing it. Well, for many, the shape of an open ladder is a triangle. And for many, the triangle signifies life. So when you walk through the triangle, you are violating, right? <laughs> that space, you are tempting the fates, and potentially you're awakening the spirits that live within the triangle. And this may include evil spirits who were not pleased that you disturbed them. But you can undo the bad mojo if you accidentally walk under a ladder, you can then counter that bad luck and all the evil spirits. Here's what you do. You take your thumb and you place it between your index and middle finger. I know you're doing it right now. <laughs> I can see. <laughs> How would that look? You're sticking your thumb right there between your index and middle finger. Boom. You have undone the bad magic. If you want good fortune to happen to someone, or you want to prevent bad fortune, many times you'll say, knock on wood. It's believed the expression comes from an ancient belief that good spirits lived in the trees. So if you knocked on something wooden, you were essentially communicating to the spirits, hey, protect me. You know, can you give me a hand here? Many of us have heard about God bless you, or bless you after somebody sneezes. A gesture of politeness. Hell, I'm an atheist, and I do it sometimes out of reflex. Bless you. I just, it rolls out. I don't worry too much about it. Some people flip out. Or they have to say, Darwin bless you, or the FSM bless you, and they have to jump through all these hoops. It becomes a knee-jerk reaction. I don't worry too much about it. But the origin finds its roots in Pope Gregory the Great. He'd say to people who sneezed during the plague that the soul was escaping the body and the heart would momentarily stop as if you were dead. Therefore, they would say, God bless you as a way to welcome you back to life and make sure that them evil spirits that were sneezed out were dispatched and gone forever. The origin of wishing over a four-leaf clover, it's very vague, sort of one of those stories lost to antiquity. And it's been a symbol of good luck and fortune for a long, long time. Some traditions use it to help find a husband or a wife. Here's how it works, for single people anyway, who are looking for a spouse. You find a four-leaf clover. Good luck, by the way, because those are tough to find. If you happen to find one, you must then eat it or put it inside your shoe. Doing this activates the good luck powers, and the first person you meet after the activation will be your future mate. Word of warning, make sure you are nowhere near anyone that you would not want to spend the rest of your life with. <laughs> Here's a weird one I read. An ambulance driving down the street. I saw one on the way to work this morning. You know, you hear the siren, you check the mirror, there's an ambulance. Pull off to the side of the road, it drives by. Seeing an ambulance is very unlucky unless you pinch your nose or you hold your breath as it drives by until you see a black or a brown dog. You hold your breath? Until you see a black or brown dog, there's even a, a poem about it. Touch your toes, touch your nose, never go in one of those until you see a dog. <laughs> How'd you like to be able to predict what gender your baby is going to be? Ah, there's a superstition for that. You take a wedding band held by a piece of thread, and you suspend it over the open palm of the pregnant woman. Now, if that ring spins in an oval or circular motion, the baby's a girl. If it swings in a straight line, 
You're going to get a boy. Back to the switchboard, area code 678. Thanks for waiting. You're on the Thinking Atheist radio podcast. Who's this? This is Dharma. Dharma, thanks for calling the show. Thanks for waiting on me. What's going on? I wanted to throw out a few tidbits involving my Taiwanese mother. We got a maybe, superstitious maybe mom in the family? What's what's the story? Not my mom, but my grandma. Oh. She was born and raised in Taiwan, probably moved here in her 40s, 50s, whatever. But one thing, when my mom was very young, uh, grandma bought some kind of an outfit. supposed to be a present for a friend. But mom decided it was really, really pretty and wanted to try it on. Well, grandma caught her and said, that's it. It's yours. It's ruined now. Mom's like, why is it ruined? Something about having the clothes on. It's like part of her spirit went into the clothes, something like that. So now it was tied to my mother. So it was no longer useful as a gift. She tainted it by wearing it? Pretty much. The next one that was fun and threw my dad for a loop, but bless his heart, he did it anyway. Mm -hmm. We hadn't seen my grandmother for, say, three or four years. And I don't know how she came up with this, but we had to go to the back door with, like, a cantaloupe and three white (laughs) candles in a box so that we could go into the house. I guess it was kind of like burning white sage to open the doors of communication, something, something, something. And you know what? I don't know what we would have done if there wasn't a back door. And this was your I, normal? I guess we or... had to crawl in the window. Look, as you're growing up, what's going on in your head? Are you thinking, this is crazy. We're just keeping Grandma happy? Or did you buy it at the time? Pretty much keeping Grandma happy. I didn't buy that stuff. That's nah, sweet nah, of nah, you. Nah. Everybody grab your props yeah, and let's walk around the house and bless it. <laughs> Keep Grandma happy. Don't forget the cantaloupe. <laughs> Don't forget the cantaloupe. Any others? The last one I'll throw out just because I thought it ended amusingly. My husband's mother follows an old one where if you spill some salt on the table, knock over the salt shaker, you have to put some in your hand and throw it over your shoulder. Yeah. She does this every time. And all I can think of is, you have to vacuum that up later. Why are you wasting salt? <laughs> yeah, that's going to get everywhere. If I can't walk through the kitchen in my bare feet, thank you very much. But to move forward, I work with a largely Hispanic population. English is not necessarily their first language. Well, someone knocked over salt during lunch, and they're like, oh, no, you're going to have bad luck. So I threw out the story, well, just throw some over your shoulder. He didn't quite get it, so he has this salt shaker, and he's shaking it like mad onto his shoulders, getting it all over his clothes. <laughs> and I'm trying to explain to him, no, 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 you're good. You throw it over the shoulder, but he still, I don't, I don't know. He salted that was a himself. Lot of salt he, he salted himself. He did himself. assault himself. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I always like yeah, my no, family no. members and friends well-seasoned before we spend the evening together. So, <laughs> Arma, thanks for the call. Thanks for listening. I appreciate you. All right. Thank you, Seth. All right. See you later. Had an Bye. email in from Satu who said, your podcast is a pleasant routine of mine. Thanks so much for listening. I appreciate it. I grew up in a home without religion or gods. My mom was openly hostile to Christianity. I think this is something she inherited from home. My mother and her sisters and brothers didn't have the most stable of home conditions. Every one of them had to find their own way of healing their scars. Unfortunately, most of them turned into drugs and alcohol for the source of remedy. One of them is a kleptomaniac. Believe me, the element of surprise and fear is always constant when shopping with her. Not my mother, though. She drank, but not so much that she would be described as an alcoholic. Instead, she was full of hate for everything and everyone. Her mood swung up and down, and she's still full of nasty words and thoughts. Jeez, breaking my heart here. One of her closest sisters turned into a Pentecostalist. Is that a word? Or a Pentecostal? Pentecostalist. Hang on, the curiosity is killing me. Penty. (laughs) Penty. Pentecostalist. There it is. I learned something new today. Thanks. One of her closest sisters turned into a Pentecostalist when trying to heal the scars left by physically abusive father and mentally abusive mother. Her personality changed, and my mother lost something. I think this is why my mother hates religion so much. 
The sister is the one who sends postcards telling us what will happen if we don't accept Jesus into our hearts. Going to hell on every birthday, name day, and Christmas. This sister didn't turn up full of love and honesty after finding Jesus. On the contrary, she's mean, greedy, she lies. Ah, come on! You're hurting my heart here, man. <laughs> she just uses Jesus as an excuse to bail herself out. Although mother hated Christianity, I didn't have the luxury to live without superstition. So I had to obey rules of spitting over my shoulder when seeing a black cat crossing the road, throwing salt over my left shoulder if it spilled on the table. We collected nine different flowers on Midsummer's Eve in total silence, and I had to sleep with them under my pillow. The man I see in my dreams would be my future husband. You can imagine the horror ten-year-old me felt one midsummer morning after seeing the neighbor's forty-year-old man in my sleep. Still much better superstition than rolling naked on a field owned by a boy you are in love with. It was believed that when the morning mist evaporates from your skin, the love will also rise in the boy's heart and he will fall in love with you. The story goes on. My mother used to see signs of death everywhere. Usually i die in some strange accident or disease. Specifically, birds were messengers of death. Knock on wood when saying something you don't want to come true. Naki, the spirit of the water, lives in wells and lakes and could catch me at any moment. Dreams were something that she analyzed with books. Usually they meant someone tried to harm her. For me, the funniest superstition relates on spruce twigs and playing with them. Spruce twigs mean death to her, but only for her. So every Christmas, I put them on my doorstep. <laughs> Just turn that screw. Just turn it. Christmas is now really calm because the twigs keep my mother from coming over. Ha ha, Satu, thank you so much. I hope you have more peace and joy in your life right now than you did growing up. I mean, I know that we're talking about fun stuff and superstitions and crazy beliefs and whatnot. But, you know, to hear about young people oppressed by superstitious and for any reason oppressive mothers and fathers, it really does grieve me. It really does weigh on my heart. And I think it weighs on the audience's heart as well. So, you know, I hope you're in a good place. I hope you're surrounded by love and joy and support. And if you are surrounded by people who do not love you and support you for who you are and who give you shit, I think it is time to continue to put the spruce twigs <laughs> all over the place. <laughs> Go out. Maybe there's somewhere you can buy wholesale and you can just put them everywhere. You know, I heard someone say that uh, you, I mean, this is a gross oversimplification, I guess, but it, you are the CEO of your life. You know, you can hire and fire. If there's people in your life who are only bringing negativity and depression and bad stuff, it's absolutely your prerogative to close that door, say thanks for coming, and you're not welcome, and I'm going to surround myself with people who do make me better and who do bring good things into my life. So I hope you found that. I didn't mean to digress, but it was just something when I read the first few paragraphs of your letter that were kind of on my mind, you know, and you don't need superstitions to be happy. That's for sure. Let's roll back to the switchboard quickly and talk to area code 203. You're on the Thinking Atheist radio podcast. Who's this? Josh, this is Josh Pierce from Connecticut. Thanks for calling, man. What's going on, Josh? Well, for starters, I actually have to say, uh, you know, it's a good thing I'm not superstitious because uh, the last time I called in, I was doing laundry like I am tonight. And my washing machine nearly blew up and I was trying to do the same thing while I was waiting on the line tonight, too. So it's bad <laughs> luck. You've got a bad <laughs> spirit. There's something there's something hiding in the mirror that's coming out to, you know, wreak havoc. Clearly, you know, there's got to be something wrong with the machine that there's, you know, demons haunting it or something. Apparently so. You know, yeah. Otherwise, it wouldn't do stuff like that, clearly. Yeah. <laughs> Well, what do you have for us tonight? Well, um, my story's kind of on a religious and superstitious level. Dude, the two overlap. Kind of sad, no, uh, uh, you know, religious, yeah, they, they superstitious, overlap. trust me, you're on my page. So, yeah, you're good. Well, about a week and a half ago, my father passed away. And since then, I know it's tough on all of my family, but they've been coming up with all these strange superstitions to try and make it seem like my dad is still around. And it's it's really, really weird. Like, um, one of the first days after my father had passed, I was sitting in my mom's house and a window was open and it blew over a stack of paper cups. And suddenly 
well, clearly that had to be my dad wandering the house, pushing things around. And it's like, no, the, the window was open. And it was breezy outside. You know, you can't, you know, that happened. And then uh, also to apparently my mom read some, I don't know, spiritual book that says if you find money after somebody dies, it's that they're leaving pennies from heaven. And it's just silly. And I noticed that um, apparently she found pennies all over her den, but there's a little tray where all the pennies are right next to there. So, of course, they fell on the floor. So every time somebody walks in, I noticed that people would knock into the little tray and the pennies would fall on the floor. And then everybody's running around going, oh, look, dad is spreading pennies all over the house. It's like, no, that's people knocking into the little tray. Hey, on a serious note, how you doing? I mean, that was just a few days ago. Um, I'm doing all right, actually. I, I got to say, it's, uh, it's been tough, but I feel like I've been able to deal with it a lot better than the rest of my family. Are you um, in a highly is, religious culture? Um, not really. I mean, my mom is very religious. She's an Orthodox Christian, and the rest of my family is fairly religious of varying faiths, so they all think I'm crazy. Well, you know, I've but heard a lot of stories of, of people seeking comfort after the death. You know, it's like if there's a, a picture that's crooked on the wall, well, it was because, you know, the spirit of granddad is there to remind them that he's in the room with them. You know, these tiny and innocuous circumstances all somehow become a sign from heaven or uh, a yeah. method of communication from those we've lost. And I understand where that comes from. I mean, they're grieving, they're going, they're coping, right? They're trying to deal yeah, and I definitely get where they're coming from on that, but it's one of those, it's not helping them deal. It's like they're hanging on to it more because of their superstitions. Yeah. And I find it tough because this is the first major thing that I've had to deal with uh, as a tragedy since I've become an atheist. And I feel like I've gotten this pretty well because of my atheism. I was able to realize that, you know, I loved my dad and I really wish he was still here, but there's nothing I can do about that. He's gone, and I have to accept it. And I think I was able to accept it fairly easily. We did a whole show on, on like, grieving without God and and recovery. And I had listened to that uh, a long time ago when it had aired. And that because of that, it was very helpful, that and several other podcasts of yours were very helpful in, you know, getting me by. And along with other things that, you know, I've read and heard and things like that, accepting life as nature and yeah. no way around it. Well, honestly, my heart goes out to you. I'm so sorry for the loss of your father. But, you know, it's a reminder, life's a gift. We have a privilege of, of being here to maximize every moment. And I think your honest, skeptical life would make him proud. So it's my pleasure to talk to you, man. Thanks for calling the show. Um, actually, uh, one other thing, Seth, uh, on two occasions, uh, when, when my uh, my wife bought me one of your shirts for Christmas, I've got um, I'm Damn, I can't remember what's on the shirt. Uh, with but, uh, I was, was it wearing, the personal was relationship wearing, was, with the reality wearing, shirt, or uh... that's the one? Yep, that's the one. Yeah. And uh, I was I was wearing that. It was like the first thing that was in a pile of clothes when my mom called in the middle of the night and said your dad's dying, and I grabbed that and put it on. So I was wearing that, and it kind of helped me feel a little better just to, you know, have that. And actually, it was the thing I was wearing the day my son was born, too, about three months ago. So you were wearing the personal relationship with the reality shirt upon the news of your father's death and your child's birth? Yep. I don't know what to do with that. I, I'm a little overwhelmed. <laughs> wow, you know? But, you know, I honestly, I, I think it's a great philosophy for living. You know, we just want to have a personal relationship with reality, to live and exist and act in the real world and put all the superstitious craziness behind us, man. I do wish you the best and, and all happiness, and thanks for calling, okay? Thanks a lot, Seth. All right, take it easy. Bye. Nathan said, I've been a listener for many months, but being in the UK means I have to listen the day after. Man, I'm sorry about that. I know our overseas listeners always are, you know, say, I wish you wouldn't air it in the evening in the States. Sorry about that. Um, he said, when I was about seven, one of my friends told me something. He said, when you're walking down the street, if you see one of those long drain covers, which has two segments on it, then it's good luck if you walk over it. If you walk over a cover with three segments, that's bad luck. But if you walk over a single drain, that resets 
your luck. And I've obeyed this little tenet since the day it was told to me. <laughs> Even in my adult years, when I identified as an atheist, I have no idea why I obeyed this little piece of superstition. I had no reason to trust my friend above anyone else. It's something I find myself subconsciously being drawn to, walking over double drains and avoiding triple ones. Nathan, thanks so much for the message. We're going to deal a little bit more with why people do these types of things closer to the end of the podcast here in a couple of minutes. Area code 775. You're on the Thinking Atheist radio podcast. Who's this? This is the shaman. Shaman. Wes, what's going on, my friend? I was calling to tell you about the origins of iron. Yeah, we've been and seeing that common it's theme. so superstitious? Iron has some sort it of dates, magical power or something? What's the story? Exactly. It dates back to the Iron Age, and when these blacksmiths were the only ones who knew how to work it. And so it was believed to be magic. And it would, uh, it, 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 if you look at uh, a lot of the old fey creatures, elves, sprites, brownies, those kind of things, their big weakness was cold iron was one of their big weaknesses. And so iron was believed to keep away evil. Another big one. Uh, this was one that I was very guilty of. You never cross the path of a toad. You never pick up a toad because otherwise you'll get warts. Yeah, you know, I heard that one when I was a kid. Honestly, the reason I didn't ever want to pick up a toad is because it always peed on me. Well, oh, look, it's a toad, and then, you know, shit, it's all over my Yeah, head, it'll so. piss on you, but uh, I, I always picked them up, and I never got warts. I mean, when I was a little guy, I'd even kiss them, and they'd... Wes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, I was a farm kid. Sue me. <laughs> oh. But, uh, all right, hang on. Visual, visual. No, 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 no. Okay, it's gone. <laughs> Another one was, uh, another one from around where I grew up was that if you split the tongue of a magpie, it will reveal your future. Split the tongue of a magpie? A magpie is a uh, bird that is related to crows. Yeah, I know what a magpie is. How do you split split the tongue? You cut it in half. While it's alive? While it's alive. No. No, 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 no. (laughs) No. (laughs) But if you split the tongue, it would start talking and it would reveal your future. At least this is what my grandparents told me. Screwed up world. Your grandparents are screwed up, people. Wes. (laughs) (laughs) Aren't all our grandparents. They're cutting up magpies. It's just wrong. Well, I appreciate the call and and for bringing some new superstitions to the table. That's awesome. My pleasure, Seth. All right. We'll see you later. Have a great day. Take it easy. Splitting the tongue of the mag hurts your heart. A few other superstitions. If you make a bedspread or a quilt, you got to finish it. Don't ever leave them uncompleted or you'll never be married. If you place your bed facing north and south, you will have misfortune. Facing north and south, it has to be facing east-west? If you get out of bed, do it on the same side that you get in or you'll have bad luck. When making the bed, don't interrupt your work. If you start making the bed, you must finish, or you'll have a restless night. You won't sleep well. Did you know that under the mistletoe, if someone wants to kiss you and you refuse, you'll be cursed with bad luck? Did you know that evil spirits cannot harm you when you're standing with friends in a circle? Did you know it's unlucky to rock an empty rocking chair? Let's do one more before we close it up here. Area code 502. You're on the Thinking Atheist radio podcast. Who is this? Amber. Hi, Amber. Thanks for waiting. What's going on? Nothing much. This is my first time listening, actually. So this has been a lot of fun. How are we doing? Are we um, holding your attention? You know, is your is drool coming oh, of out of course. your mouth? Are you wandering around <laughs> looking for something else to do? How no, are we doing? No, it's been great. I actually have something interesting pertaining to the first call that you had, the guy who grew up in the Jewish household, Mm -hmm. because I'm from Kentucky, and most of my family members are from eastern Kentucky, so they always had another, the, you know, superstitions, always, and they weren't really religious at all, 
But um, the one he talked about where walking over people, we actually heard the same thing growing up. But it wasn't that it would stunt the growth of anybody. It would just be bad luck. So if someone's lying down, you step over them, that's bad luck. Bad luck. Did you believe it at the time? Growing up, it was just something, unfortunately, it was just something we did. I didn't really question it, and I'm an atheist now, but so it's kind of funny to look back. But I I don't know, and I wrote down some other ones, like uh, the ears burning, that means someone's talking about you. Mm -hmm. Um, Another good one was if you heard your name, but then nobody was around, that was bad luck. It's just funny. That's happened to me. Has it ever happened to you? Yeah, and I think back on that, and like my mother saying, well, that's bad luck. And then I just start to laugh. Like, why would that be bad luck? I just want to know why I heard my name. Like, Seth. And I turn around and there's, <laughs> you know, and I, I, it could be anything. You know, it could be something on the television. It could be anything. Seth. Or let's say there's a crowd exactly. of people all talking to each other, no one talking to me, and I feel like I heard my name. It's weird. It's <laughs> just bizarre. Yeah. Let me ask you this. How did you discover the show? Oh, gosh, I can't even remember. I just know I've been following you all on Facebook for a while. I see. I think it was probably advertised or something. You were part of the Facebook community, and I'm posting like, hey, join us for the show. And so you just happened to click in here tonight and check it out. Well, I'm glad you listened, and it means a lot that you were part of the show. You take care of yourself, all right? You too. Thank you. All right. See you later. So why are we superstitious? Why are often rational people? superstitious. Well, you know, I often mention Shermer's book, Why People Believe Strange Things. And there are so many articles out there about it. Well, back to the original article we started the show with, reported by CBS Sunday Morning and the reporter Susan Spencer. She quoted Cornell University psychology professor, a guy named Tom Gilovich, and he said that our brains are actually wired to believe superstitious nonsense, right? We want to find cause and effect everywhere. And uh, many times people will see patterns everywhere they go. The baseball player who's got the elaborate superstition about putting his socks on in a certain order. All right, I was reading about an athlete and I guess he was on a winning streak and he refused to shave his beard. Big old bushy beard. He, He wasn't going to shave as long as he was winning. And they say that there are people who genuinely benefit from feeling this way. It's all psychological. Jennifer Whitson, the University of Texas in Austin, says superstitions grow out of our need to take charge, to reduce anxiety. Quote, if you're a more anxious person, you're sort of set up to be a little more superstitious. You have a lot more ambient anxiety. We become very anxious when we lack control. One of the ways, if we can't regain it objectively, is to try and regain it perceptually. Maybe I can't actually keep something bad from happening to me, but if I knock on wood, then I've done something, right? I've taken an action. That can help someone feel less anxious as a result. Check this out. Researchers gave golf balls to two groups of people and sent them to a putting green. One group was told they had lucky golf balls. The other was not. Guess what? Those people who had the lucky golf balls were 35% more likely to make their putts. And it's psychological. Anxiety goes down, performance goes up. And in this weird and twisted way, it seems as if sometimes superstitions just might work. A huge thank you for listening to the show tonight. And a big thank you out to our sponsor, Audible.com. By the way, a free audio book is waiting for you at Audible.com. If you want to listen to it, Audible has it with over 150,000 titles and virtually every genre. You'll find what you're looking for. Log on right now and get your free audio book and 30-day trial. Sign up at audiblepodcast.com slash thinkingatheist. And I'll see you next week. Follow The Thinking Atheist on Facebook and Twitter. Watch dozens of original videos on The Thinking Atheist YouTube channel. And visit our website for resources, links, contact information, the editor's blog, and more. TheThinkingAtheist.com